Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Amen. Man, it's good to be in church. Are you glad to be in church? If you are, say amen. amen. We are glad you're here too. Welcome to Southern Hills Baptist Church. Turning your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter number 1, verse 35 is our text. You made it. You're here. You've been waiting all week to come to church, and finally Sunday got here. You woke up this morning and said, now it's church day. I get to go see Pastor Josh. <laughs> yeah. That was sad. That was sad. Amen. We are glad you're here. We're having a great time in church today. What a great job our worship team did. And thank God for our choir and our worship team and all those that come. They come here at 8 o'clock in the morning and stay all the way through. Praise God for them. Maybe you're new to the church and you're like, man, I love coming on Sundays, but I sure would love a little one-on-one -on -one time with you, pastor, or one of the pastors. Well, that's why we have what's called Friday with Pastors. And I spend every Friday all day long at the coffee shop. I meet with people and I'd love to meet with you. All you have to do is call the church offices and schedule a time to get together and we will have a good coffee break together. Men, 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 are there any men in the room? Are there any men in the room? There's one man. There's a man. There's a man in the room. Men, are you ready for a brocation? You ready for a little man time? We're going up to a men's retreat, 48-hour getaway, uh, just in California. 48-hour. Uh, no, it's only a 24-hour, excuse me, 24-hour getaway in California. And look, we're going to have a great time of food and fellowship and firearms. And uh, <laughs> <clears throat> It's a brocation. Anyway, if you're interested, please sign up. Uh, we really are going to have a great time. It's coming in March, but we want you to sign up soon and let us know about that. Uh, I'm going to be there. We're going to have a great time uh, together. How many of you are a little OCD and it is killing you that these lights are not turned on? How many of you are like, what's wrong with those lights? Okay, here's the deal. There are, there are 600 of these lights. They represent the 600 adults that are signing up for small group this year. And thus far, we only have 881 signups. There are 19 that have not to sign up. So if you're like, well, what do we do? Okay, this is what you need to do. Sign up for small group, and you can come twist a light like that, all right? You say, but I'm already signed up for small group. Then get people to sign up, because I swear to you, it will stay like this <laughs> until I get 600 adults signing up for small group. Uh, but yeah, we'd love to see you sign up for small group. Uh, in the weeks, and you don't know which one you might, maybe, you, maybe it's about raising children, we have Growing Kids God's Way, you can join that one, or just a regular Bible study small group, or maybe FPU, Financial Peace University, one of those, that'd be great. Look, eight days from now, there is an event that we're having we've never had before at our church. It's on a Monday evening, and I know some of you work on Mondays, so you're going to have to quit your job. And come, no, next Monday night, eight days from now at 6.30 p.m., I have a, a guest speaker that we've scheduled for just Monday night. His name is Dr. Tom Rayner. He's one of the premier church leaders in our nation today. He wrote many good books on what it is to build a church, grow a church, and disciple people. You may have not heard of him. You may have heard of some of his books. You can Google him. Fantastic guy. Anyway, he's going to be here live Monday night, eight days from now at 6.30 p.m. I want to encourage you, if you're a leader in the community, a leader in your workplace, or a leader in this church, we're going to be talking about leadership principles, and I want to invite you to come. This is a ticketed event for outside of our church, and people are paying to come. You come for free. If you're a member or an attender of the church, you come for free. We actually have over 200 pastors from around the country who are going to be here for that event. And I want to give you opportunity to be here uh, Monday evening at 6.30 p.m. I hope that you'll come. Okay, let's get into the Word of God. Mark chapter number one. It is a sermon series entitled Ignite, a single spark can start a movement. Today is the third sermon in our series. The sermon is entitled, Feed the Flame. Say it with me. Feed the Flame. Say it again. Say it again. Feed the Flame. Say it again. Say it again. Feed the Flame. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, have you ever woken up a long time before the sun came up? So did Jesus. 
Jesus went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So let us pray. Father, my prayer is over this next 30, 45, the next 30 or 40 minutes, you would give us insight into your word. My prayer, Father, is simple. As you have filled this place with your people, you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit and you would fill my mouth with your Holy Word and you would allow us to see truth and apply it to our lives. Oh God, I pray for the person who's new here today that they would get the truth today, that they would come and they would receive what you sent them here for. I pray for the person who's been here a long time. Lord, the message that you have for them is so relevant to their life today. I pray they would receive it in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Feed the flame. Years ago, when my children were younger, we liked to go camping. We would go out and get a tent and start a fire and, and camp. This is what we would do. In fact, here's a photograph of us camping years ago with my young children. Okay, when the pastor shows a picture of his family, the correct response is, aww. No, don't try now. Go back, go back, go back. Let's try this again. Years ago, whenever my children were young, we liked to go camping. <laughs> that was way early. You messed up everybody. Look at that. I am not moving from this point. Go back. Here we go. Years ago, when my children were young, we liked to go camping with the children. Oh, stop. That's not necessary. <laughs> we did. We had a lot of fun. And and they were in the why phase during this age. They were very young. They were in the why phase. You know, why are we going camping? The answer is because we don't have enough money for a hotel room. You know what I mean? <laughs> why, 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 why do we bring a tent? And why, why, why are we building a fire? And here's actually a little video of them building the fire, teaching them to build the fire. Here they are putting stuff in. Oh, there's a little Scarlet. She's going to fall in and, and die, right? And uh, why, why are we in the woods? This is the redwoods. And why did we go here? And why are we going camping? And what do you put in the fire? And, and why do you put those things in the fire? And I remember sitting around that little fireplace with my children. And I remember as I had Savannah and Jonathan, just very young at the age, I remember sitting there and I remember teaching them about how to build a fire and why. Why do we have this fire? Here's why. Because Jonathan... Whenever the sun goes down, it's going to get very dark. And when it gets really dark, this fire will provide light for us. So you have to feed the flame. Also, it's going to get kind of hungry around here. And there's no McDonald's around the corner. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make the food right on the fire. And so if we're going to make food on the fire, we have to feed the flame. Oh, and there's another reason. It's going to get cold at night, and we don't have any heater. We're outside. There's a little tent, but it's, but it's not that warm, and so we, what we have to do is we have to feed the flame. And because we get hungry, and because it gets dark, and, and, and because, it gets, because, uh, because we get cold, we need to feed the flame. Now listen to me. The same is true in our lives. The world that we're in gets very dark. And so we need the flame inside of us to grow. The world we're in offers a lot of things to satisfy our hunger, but it can't satisfy our hunger, so therefore we need to feed the flame. The world we live in, the world we live in can not only be a very dark place and a very hungry place, the world we live in, friend, it can be... I forgot the third thing I taught my child. <laughs> it can be a very cold place. And therefore, we need to feed the flame. How do we feed the flame? What do we feed the flame? Friend, my proposition today is very simple. You got to feed the flame. The question is how. How do I keep the flame of the love of Jesus Christ burning inside of me? As we've studied throughout the book of Mark thus far, we've seen that the flame of the gospel of Jesus Christ started with a single spark. And then he gathered friends around him, a community, a small group, to take that flame forward. But if you don't feed the flame of your life, I'm telling you, it will die out and you'll walk away from Christ and your life will be ruined. And I hate to be overly dramatic today, but I'm telling you, friend, you have to feed the flame 
of your walk with God. How do we do this? In this passage today, we learned three ways that you can feed the flame. No matter who you are as you follow Christ, here are the three ways. The first way you feed the flame, number one, is you need time alone with God. Say it with me. Time alone with God. In this passage, verse 35 through 39, we see that Jesus spends time alone with the Father. Look at verse 35. I hope you brought a Bible. If you didn't, stop at the desk on the way out. We'll give you a free Bible. Look at verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before the daylight, Jesus went out into a solitary place, and there he, what does it say? Even Jesus, listen, even Jesus took time to get up early in the morning to spend time with the Father. And if Jesus needed time with his Father, God the Father, friend, so do you need time with God the Father. Already in his life, everybody was needing something from Jesus. It seemed like everybody needed something from Jesus. And what did he need to do? He needed to get up and help everybody. No, what he needed to do was get up and feed the flame so that he could help others. In fact, look how the passage plays out. It's fascinating. It says in the next verse, verse 36, Simon Peter, remember him from last week? Simon Peter, one of his disciples, those that were with him, searched for Jesus. So they woke up in the morning and they looked around and they're like, Jesus! Jesus, Jesus, have you seen Jesus? Where is he? He's gone. Jesus, how many of you, how many of you know what that's like? The moment people wake up in your home, they start shouting for your name. How many mothers in this room who still have young children? They wake up and it's like, mom, don't spend time in prayer, feed my face, All right? And so they began searching for him, and that's what happens in this passage. And Simon and those that were with him searched for him, verse 37, and they found Jesus, and they said unto him, everyone is looking for you. They literally interrupt Jesus in his time alone with the Father. This is God the Son spending time with God the Father, and he's praying and searching for God. And at this moment, he's talking to God the Father, and he's feeding that flame. And the disciples come, and they're like, hey, hey, everybody down in the city of, Na- uh, of Capernaum is looking for you. Look at it, look, look, look. This is what happens in our modern society. It happened back then. If you are a person of any influence, the moment you wake up, people need your attention. Facebook needs your attention. Your employees need your attention. Your employer needs your attention. Your friends need your attention. Your spouse needs your attention. Your children need your attention. Everybody needs you. Everybody needs you. Everybody needs you. And so you wake up and you stress out and you help everybody. You fall into the bed and you wake up and you stress out and you fall into the bed at the end of the day. And it's just a constant cycle. Here's what we need to do. We need to stop and we need to escape from the crowd and we need to spend time with God in prayer. Look, look. How could Jesus help others if he's not spending time feeding the flame with the Father? How can you bring warmth to others if you're not feeding the flame? How can you feed others if you're not feeding the flame? How can you bring light into the darkness if you're not feeding your own flame with your God? Spending time with God is what I'm talking about. To be, to, to be very blunt, this is what I'm talking about. I'm saying every day you should spend alone time with God, just you. Feeding yourself from the word of God. Prayer. Everyone is looking for you, verse 38. But Jesus said to them, all right, let's go back to Capernaum and give in to the demands of everybody. Is that what he says? No, look at what he says. He says, okay, let's go to different towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose have I come. Ooh, the purposes of Jesus. Come back to that in just a moment. For this purpose have I come, and he preached also in their synagogues throughout all the other towns of Galilee, casting out demons. So they come to him and say, hey, Jesus, we got to get back to town because everybody wants you there. And Jesus is like, I got a better idea. Let's ignore them and go somewhere else. What? More on that in a moment. I'm thankful that in my life I've had examples of prayer, people who would rise early and pray. My mother is one such example. I remember we had a rule growing up. You have to knock on mom and dad's door. Don't just walk in. Bad things could happen if you don't knock. <laughs> Sometimes I missed the rule, and I walked right in. One time I did that, and I saw my mother on her knees 
at her bedside praying for us. Just praying. Man, it's seared into my mind. My brother was an example of prayer in my life. When I went to college, he's two years older than me. When I went to college, he, we, I, I, I got in his dorm room. And I remember he was 20, I'm 18, we're just young guys. But I can remember when I woke up, I would look over day after day, and my brother would be on his knees beside his bunk, just praying. He taught me how to pray, my brother. He said, when you pray, he said, you get on your knees. And he says, what I like to do is I like to visualize the throne of God in front of me. And God sitting on the throne. And I talk to him like I'm his servant. He's my master. I'm his friend and his son. And now I do that. Even this morning when I woke up and prayed, I do the same thing. My brother taught me. I had an example of prayer. He said, man, I wish I had an example of prayer in my life. You do have an example of prayer. Jesus. Before the sun ever came up, early in the morning, he knew the demands of those around him would press upon him. So he said, if I'm going to spend time with the Father, i got to get up early and do it. See, I think we're asking the wrong question. I think a lot of people ask the question, a lot of Christians ask the question, do I have time to pray? That is the wrong question. The question you should ask is, do I need help from God today? Okay, well, it's morning. Do I have time to pray? Nope, wrong question. You wake up. Do I need help from God? Yes. Yes, I need God. Then no matter what it takes, get on your knees. Spend time with God. Put off everything else. Allow yourself to be late to work if that's what it takes. Allow the child to scream for three minutes if that's what it takes. Can I get an amen, moms? And I'm not even joking about this. Some of you are going to send me an email. Feed the children. I get it. Yeah, feed the children. Relax. Say, is that my voice? Yes. <laughs> that's your voice. When I get it on email, that's how I read it. <laughs> They'll survive three minutes without a mother who feeds them. They're not going to survive long without a mother who doesn't pray for them. I'm telling you, I'm not trying to get on your case. I love you. Get up and pray. Spend time in prayer. You say, I don't know how to pray. You don't know how to pray. Look. That's why as your pastor and your church, we've provided an entire class that teaches people how to pray. It's called Grow Class. It's a four-week class where two of those weeks talk about Bible study and prayer. And I'm telling you, you should take that class just to learn how to pray. In that class, Pastor Fred teaches specifically about this. In fact, Linda Johnson, a recent graduate of the class, this is what she said about the class itself and about prayer. It was in Grow Class that I actually learned the importance of prayer in my daily life and how to pray in a meaningful way. Sometimes we pray and it doesn't even accomplish anything. I'm telling you, man, you ought to to get a part of this. Number one, look, you have to get to the point if you're going to help others, that you're feeding the flame. And you need to feed the flame with the right material. And how do you feed the flame? Number one, time alone with God. Number two, how do I feed the flame, Pastor? Number two, you've got to protect your real purposes. This one's more difficult to understand, so I want you to say it out loud and get it in your heart. Protect your real purposes. Say it again, say it again. Protect your real purposes. In our story thus far, Jesus fed, his, uh, fed the flame by spending time alone with God. And the second thing he did was he protected the real purposes that he was called to. In this passage, that's exactly what he does. He protects the real purposes. He knew the real reasons he was there. Before I read the passage, let me ask you the question. What are your primary purposes? Why are you a human? Why do you exist? Why are you here? Have you scheduled and set out your priorities, your purposes? If you're not sure what they are, I've preached this sermon before, but I'll give them to you. Intimacy, family, ministry. Intimacy with God is the number one calling in your life. Everything else can vanish. That is primary. Family. Before everyone else, care for your, fa- your family, your spouse, your children, those closest to you. If we were all do this, as the word of God says, we would be well. Ministry, your vocation, 
whatever you do for a living, what you do for the church, whatever it is that God has called you to. The point is this, keep your purposes and your priorities forefront. The problem is a lot of times we get called away to minor things that really don't matter and we leave behind the primary purposes of why God has us here. See, your real purposes, we get diverted all the time. We get diverted from our purposes. Sometimes we get diverted from our purposes by sinful things, right? We're walking with God and all of a sudden, sinful thing catches our eye. We're diverted from God's prayer. But sometimes it's not sinful things. Sometimes it's just neutral things. Things that are not bad or good. They just get us away from God. They get us away from what we're supposed to be doing. Does that make sense? Neutral things like like Netflix. (laughs) I have a real problem. Let me just tell you this. Okay. I have a real problem. Every time I'm flipping through the channels and I see a Rocky movie, I have to stop. Like it's Rocky Balboa, man. And he's running up those stairs and he needs me to watch. How many of you know, how many of you are Rocky fans here today? Oh man, you gotta, I gotta watch. And and I'll sit there and be like, I'm just gonna watch for a minute. (laughs) Two hours later, you know what I mean? And so sometimes it's sinful things that get us off track. Sometimes it's neutral things. That, sometimes it's good things that get us off track. You see, sometimes we sacrifice the best things for some good things. You say, what do you mean, Pastor Josh? Listen, if you are sacrificing time with God to spend time with your children, you are sacrificing best things for good things. If you are sacrificing, listen, if you're sacrificing time at work or time with your children so that you can be at work more, you're sacrificing best things for good things. It's not bad. It's just not in priority. Does that make sense? And in this passage, we see that Jesus exemplifies this for us. Look at verse 40. It's going to blow your mind. Look at verse 40 through 45. Now a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you will make me clean. Okay, picture this. The disciples come to Jesus. Jesus, everybody's looking for you. Let's get back to town. Jesus says, no, we're not going back there. There are other people we need to go to. So they start walking to the other towns. And as they walk to the other towns, a leper, somebody with leprosy, comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, stop. I know if you wanted to heal me, you could heal me. A good thing or a bad thing for Jesus to heal this man? Is it good or bad? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Look what happens in the story. You'll be fascinated, especially if you're a Bible student. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, stretched forth his hand and touched him. Now listen. No matter when or where anybody ever comes to Jesus, Jesus always responds with compassion and love. Now look at me. No matter who you are or what your background is or no matter what situation or illness you have, Christ has compassion on you. He wants you to come to him and he can heal. But watch the purpose of this passage play out. Jesus reached out and touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And verse 43, very strange. So the man is healed, verse 43. And Jesus strictly warned the man and sent him away at once and said unto him, See that you say nothing to anyone. What? Jesus heals the man with leprosy, and he says to the man, Go away and don't tell anybody what I did. Have you ever read this passage and thought, That's weird. I thought you were supposed to tell everybody about Jesus. How many of you believe you should tell everybody about Jesus? Say amen. amen. Okay, then why did Jesus tell this man, don't tell anybody? The reason is, is because Jesus knew in this moment what his primary purpose was. His primary purpose was teaching the word of God, not being a magic man. And Jesus knew if this man went around and told everybody, there would be thousands of people who showed up saying, show us some magic tricks. And Jesus is saying, don't tell anybody because if you tell people, they're going to come look for magic and all I want to do is teach the word. I'm here to bring redemption. I'm here to bring people to salvation. Jesus was not a magic man. His primary calling, his real purpose was teaching, not healing in this moment. 
However, if you don't believe me, look at what the rest of the scripture says, verse 45. However, he, sent, he went his way, the man that was healed, and he began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in desert places, and they came to him from every direction. Okay, so what happens was the guy goes and tells everybody, and now Jesus, after visiting the other towns, goes back to his headquarters, Capernaum, and the city is so overcrowded with people looking for him, Jesus couldn't even get to the city. He could not get in the city to teach them the word of God like he was called to do because he had these people saying, do a magic trick for me. Do a magic trick. In fact, the reputation of Jesus among some during this time was only what could you feed me and what magic trick can you give me? That's, that's all it was for them. We know this because later on when Jesus is about to be crucified, he stands before King Herod. And King Herod said, hey, I know you. You're the magic man from Galilee. Do a magic trick. Jesus says nothing. Doesn't play into their hand. Why? Because we know what Jesus' primary purpose was. Look what Luke, chapter, Luke specifically says. Luke chapter, it's on the screen, I think. Luke chapter 19 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. See, Jesus' primary purpose was to come and teach the Word of God, point to himself, and say, I'm the one who's here to sacrifice myself upon the cross. Now listen, Jesus' primary purpose has not changed. His primary purpose in your life is to give you eternal life in heaven with him. He wants you to recognize who he is. Don't miss this. He wants you to repent of your unbelief. He wants you to receive him as savior. He wants you to be saved. You say, well, I'm at church because I hope God gives me more money. I'm at church because I hope God heals my sickness. I'm at church. Look, that's not his primary purpose. His primary purpose is to save your soul. Have you been born again? Friend, have you been saved? Have you repented of your sin and received Christ as Savior? If you haven't received Christ as your, as your Savior, even today, here I'm going to ask a question. I want you to respond. Did Jesus want to heal people? Yes. Good, good. I was hoping you didn't miss that. I'm going to ask it again and say yes. Did Jesus want to heal people? Yes. yes. Was this his primary reason he came? No. And that's what makes this passage make sense. Jesus would not get distracted from his mission of redemption. Look at what happens in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Look what happens. And again, he entered into Capernaum after several days. After things calmed down, Jesus was able to finally sneak back into town with his disciples. And look what happens. And it was heard that he was in the house. Everybody found out he was in Simon Peter's house again. And so immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. So the Bible says as soon as the town finds out Jesus is back, they're like, Jesus is here? Magic man is here. Magic man is here. Magic man is here. And they all gather around the house. So much the Bible goes on to say there are people at the windows and the door. They couldn't even get in. Do a magic trick. But what does the Bible say he was in there doing? He was in there teaching the word of God. If you look specifically at verses 3 and 4, it says that he was in there teaching the word of God. Now, now, now look, now look. What happens next is a fascinating story that often gets misunderstood by Christians. Four men find a man who is a paralytic. He could not walk. And the Bible says they find this man, and he could not walk, and they said to his man, hey, there's a magic man who can heal you, let's take you to Jesus. So all four of them pick him up, one by each side of his bed mat. And they bring him to the house, and they see that Jesus is, the, the house of Peter is filled. And they're like, what are we going to do? And one of them says, hey, why don't we climb on top of the roof? Back then, the houses were built with flat roofs, and there were staircases that could lead you to the roof. So they crawled up in the staircase, it was so crowded, they got to the roof, and they started, and, and this, the, the roofs were often made out of mud and all of that kind of thing, and sticks and stuff, and they started digging through the roof. And they're pull, digging roots out, and they're pulling up stuff, and all of a sudden, Jesus is in there teaching the word of God, doing what he's called to do, and all of a sudden, uh, they could see light coming in. Can you imagine, how weird would that be? Like, how weird would it be right now if I'm teaching the Bible to you, and all of a sudden, somebody breaks through the roof, and they're like, hey, that'd be weird, right? We'd have security go after him, right? That's not what we would do. 
And this is what's going on. And the Bible says that they took the man and they lowered him down from the roof into the center of the room where Jesus was. What? Yeah. And when, now notice this, notice this, verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, get up and walk. Is that what he says? Look at the passage, it's right there. Jesus saw their faith and he said to the paralytic man, son, get up and walk. Is that what he says? No. What does he say? Your sins are forgiven you. Why? Because Jesus said, my primary purpose is to forgive sins, teach the word of God, bring redemption. Friend, we know that Christ kept his primary purpose because he died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose from the grave. The application to each and every one of us in this room is this. He understood his primary calling. The question is, do you understand your primary calling? Jesus knew his primary important truth. I won't be able to do that if I say yes to this. This is what you've got to grasp before I move on. You have to understand to accomplish anything in life, you need to be focused on what you truly want to accomplish. If you say yes to everything, you will accomplish very little. You and I need to learn to say no to sin, no to neutral things, and even say no to some good things. I've heard it said this way, it's easy to say no when there is a deeper yes burning inside. No, I can't make it to your thing because I have this to do. No, I can't do that for you right now because I know I have to do this right now. This is who Dr. King was. Thank God for Dr. Martin Luther King. He was so utterly focused on, yes, his intimacy with God, his family, but then his ministry, and that was to reject segregation and to bring this society into understanding the dangers of that segregation and to bring equality, racial equality within our society. Thank God for a man who was focused, you see. What is your primary purpose? Intimacy, family, ministry, real purpose. But sometimes we get diverted by all sorts of things. Okay, I'll say it this way and I'll move on. I'm a very social person. I like being, how many of you are like me? How many of you are, you're kind of an extrovert, you're a social person, you like being with people. How many of you like that? How many of you like that? Okay, a lot of you some, about half of you. How many of you say, not me, pastor, I like people, and when I say that, it means I don't like people, and <laughs> I like to be by myself quite a bit. How many of you are introvert, a little bit like that? Okay, about half and half. Some of you are so introverted, you're like, ah, uh, nope. <laughs> nope. I don't want people to look at me. All right. I like being with people, which means it's kind of cool as a pastor, I get invited to a lot of stuff. Like I'm invited to birthday parties all the time. And you say, oh, man, I'm never invited to stuff. Become a pastor. <laughs> I'm invited to Filipino parties all the time. <laughs> Got a lot of Filipinos around here, praise God, because I like me some lechon. <laughs> oh, for those who don't know what that is, that is a roasted Filipino pig. <laughs> and it's some happy time right there. Oh my word, I love it, I love being invited, but I've learned this, I've learned if sometimes on I, my family day Saturday, sometimes if I say yes to that, it means I'm saying no to my family. You, you see? I love, look, I absolutely love preaching, not just here, I preach at other retreats, I preach at churches, I preach at colleges and camps and all sorts of stuff. But I've learned this, I've learned this. If I say yes to all of those, and I only do a few, I've limited myself. If I say all yes to all of those, it means that I neglect my primary calling, that's you at this church. You see? See what I'm saying? You understand? I like social media. So sue me. <laughs> I like Facebook. I know Zuckerberg has all the dirt on me, I'm sure, you know, I... Don't give him your information. Well, he already has it all. <laughs> I like social media so much, man. The first thing in the morning, some, you know what I'm tempted to do first thing in the morning? First thing in the morning, I just want to grab my phone and look and see if anybody liked me. <laughs> Did you like me? They like me. Ooh, who liked me? They like me. Oh, they like me. Open my day with validation from social media, from people I don't know. It's not a bad thing. Here's the problem. It's not the best thing. I'm feeding the wrong flame. 
I need to wake up in the morning and to spend time alone with God. I need to protect the real purposes of why I'm here. And thirdly, what you need to do, what I need to do, to, uh, what we need to do is number three, mentally prepare for hostility. Mentally prepare for hostility. Say that with me. Mentally prepare for hostility. In the next few verses, we see the first signs of the Jesus haters. And throughout the book of Mark, you're going to see a lot of them. Say Jesus haters. Jesus haters. Here we are introduced to them for the very first time. You think, who would ever hate Jesus? Everybody should love Jesus. He heals people. He helps people. He humbly resists public adoration. But because the crowds kept growing, the enemies started rising up. Let me tell you this. As you begin to fulfill your purpose in life, you will have enemies come at you. You got to mentally prepare for that hostility. When you're feeding that flame, one of the things you got to feed that flame is you got to say, okay, as I walk with God and do what God's called me to do, people are going to stand against me. They're going to be friends that don't understand. They're going to be family that doesn't understand. They're going to be people that don't understand. And these are the people that did not understand Jesus. Look at verse 6. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Okay, did you see the picture? Man is lowered into the room. Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. And all of a sudden, the enemies of Jesus, they think inside of their own minds, forgiven sins? Who do you think you are? Only God can forgive sins. Exactly. Jesus is God. But the enemies start rising up. And look at what it says in the next verse. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he talked to them. Jesus could read their minds. Do you know why Jesus could read their minds and thoughts? Because he's God. Look what it says. It says Jesus looked at him and said, why do you reason these things in your heart? How weird would that be, by the way, if you, you met Jesus? And you're like, hey, man. And you say that out loud. And inside you think to yourself, I really like your white robe. And then he says, you just think it. And then he looks at you and he's like, oh, thanks, man. I, I got it at Herod's. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it would freak you out. <laughs> Reading your thoughts and talking to you. That's what he does with these people. He says, why do you reason these things in your heart? Is it easier for me to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or arise, take up your bed and walk? He said, is it, be, is it easier for me to forgive his sins or make him rise from, from walking? Make him rise up and walk. But then he says something. He says, but so that you can understand, I have the power to forgive sins. He looks to the man and says, rise up and walk. And the man immediately gets up, grabs his bed, and walks out. And everybody's like, whoa! They're amazed. And Christians, 2,000 years later, read it, and they think the passage is all about Jesus healing the man. It's not. It's about Jesus forgiving the sins of the man. And the primary purpose is then again displayed. But what we need to see in this moment is this. The enemies of Jesus rise up the moment Jesus starts doing what he's been called to do. So it is true in your life, my friend. Hostility rises up, so you got to be ready for it. The moment you step into the ring, you have a very serious opponent. If you're not preparing for it, if you're not taking it seriously, if you're not ready for it, if you're not feeding the flame, understand you're going to get a beat down. Which, once again, reminds me of Rocky. <laughs> Rocky three specifically. Arguably the best Rocky. It's definitely in my top eight. <laughs> Do you remember what happens in the story? Rocky one, he loses. Rocky two, he wins. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, get over it. You should have already seen him by now. Rocky three, it opens up, he's the, he's the championship, champion of the world. He's the heavyweight champion. And he's enjoying all of the benefits of being the heavyweight champion. The, the money, the fame, the family, the mansion, the new bulldog. He's got everything, baby. And then somebody like Mr. T called him out. Hey, I can fight you. And while Mr. T was ready for the fight, Rocky was out playing games. 
And when they met in the ring, he got put down because he wasn't feeding his flame. Go ahead and start following Christ. You need to be ready. You'll have opposition. Go ahead and start that new small group. You're going to have people who come after you. Go ahead and sign up for men's retreat. Go ahead and go to Growing Kids God's Way, Financial Peace University. Make that decision. Do what you're supposed to do. Start that flame in 2019. Move forward like you've never moved before. But be ready because opposition will arise. My question to you is this. Are you growing cold in this world? Do you need light in the darkness? Are you hungry for something that actually satisfies? Then feed the flame. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word, for its incredible application to our daily lives even today. And my prayer is that you would help us to not only see this truth in the moment, but God, 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 I pray that you would send us forth with this truth. Deepen it, dig it, Lord, plant it deep in our hearts so that we live it this week and this month and this year. I pray for myself and my friends in Jesus' name. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world.